Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest. She's a 2016 Olympian. She is an all NCAA All-American from Stanford. And most recently, she was a member of the LA Current in the 2020 ISL season. Today, coming to us from Coronada in California, we are talking to Andy Mires. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show. I'm, I'm happy to sit down and talk with you. Uh, like I said, you were you're a pretty pivotal member of the, of the LA Current in the ISL season. And I want to start there. Uh, six week Budapest bubble pretty unique situation in terms of, you know, swim meets and how things like that go. Um, Heading into the ISL and the Budapest bubble, uh, what were you expecting and where where were you at just physically and shape-wise? Yeah, I was really excited. Um, I had gotten back to San Diego in the fall, like in September, uh, late August. And so I felt like I was training really well and super excited to be finally racing again but I had no idea what to expect. I mean, I was a little skeptical, like it seemed crazy to go traveling with the pandemic, um, but it all turned out really well. Yeah, to to give our listeners a little bit of context, uh, you you made Swim Swam's list of 10 swimmers who broke through in the 2020 ISL season. I mean, you you made a really big impact for the current. um, And as you moved through that six week uh, training camp, along with meets. Um, can you just break down kind of your experience, mostly in the pool of, uh, of how you progressed during that period? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that recognition. I was very happy with how I did, um, but it's also nice to hear from others. Um, so yeah, I think we kind of thought of it as a training camp. So go there, get the first meet, you know, get back into racing and then just try and improve every week. And I particularly liked how our schedule lined up that we had basically a competition every week. Um, And so, you know, you could still remember what you had felt from the competition before and then, you know, see the race analysis and then go and try and change something the next time. And take me through that first competition of just how long had it been since you raced and uh, were the, were the pre-race jitters a little different than than maybe they normally were? Yeah. Uh, the last time I raced was in Des Moines at the tier pro series. Yeah. So it was, I think March, like a week before everything shut down and I had swum really well there. Um, but then we transitioned to, you know, backyard swimming. I fortunately have a pool at my house in LA. And so I was still able to touch the water um, and do a lot more dry land activity for the first few months. And then I went back to Israel for the summer um, and I'm actually in medical school. And so I did my psychiatry rotation and um, it was kind of nice to sort of have that to think about, Um, you know, and so uh, I was swimming training once per day during that time, but I felt like it was a really solid training. And when I went to the pool, I really focused. So going into ISL, I felt really prepared. The, the, so that seems like a good balance of definitely taking a step back from the normal, you know, training routine of me, I don't know, nine to 11 times a week, se- sessions a week, whether that's in, in or out of the pool, but you still got to t- keep your feel, keep the touch. I medical school balancing that and swimming. I want to get to that in a bit. Cause I didn't realize that you were doing that as well, but um, so you, you get your first race in ISL under the belt and then how do you progress forward? Were there specific changes you were kind of, okay, I can, I can do this better here. I can do this better there. Yeah, definitely. I think one of my focuses and I think even the team elite pros that were at ISL was the turn work. Um, just because it's short course and we had been focusing long course, you know, because we thought we were leading up to the Olympics. Um, So then that was like the key thing that we really tried to hound in on. And um, 
And that would definitely help with our races. So I think just kind of getting used to the walls, that was nice about being there for six weeks. So we were training in the pool that we were competing in and really knew how um, to get into those walls quickly and come off and work the underwaters. Yeah. And then just being a, a member of the LA current of a team like that, um, maybe in the pool, but also outside of the pool, um, how did how did that affect just kind of emo you emotionally and mentally during those six weeks? I thought it was really fun to be back on a team like that. You know, I had graduated from Stanford in 2013, so it was, had been a while, but I always loved being on relays. And I think that's really where I swam well as an, uh, during the ISL. Um, and especially at the beginning, I feel like I focused on the relays and that sort of got me the excitement to get into the competitions. Yeah. And then uh, coming off of ISL, now that you've had some time to digest that experience, um, do, do you feel like there were big takeaways from that for you? Yeah. I mean, I thought it was really fun. I think the whole like racing more often um, and really practicing racing. I think that I've taken that and sort of trying to do that more in practice, you know, get up on the blocks with a suit on and just practice what it's going to feel like to swim that hundred freestyle. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the team environment was super fun. And so just kind of holding on to that and trying to keep that with in practices as well. Yeah. So you said you, you, mentioned that hundred freestyle. And I mean, throughout your career, you've swam 50, 100, 200 freestyle. Uh, you've won some medals in backstroke internationally. Um, but I, I'm, I'm guessing your emphasis has been more on those uh, relay length freestyle events. Um, heading into this Olympic season, um, do you have a focus of events? I know in ISL, you won the 200 free in match number five. Uh, but you had mentioned that 100 freestyle. Is that going to be the main focus event for you long course? Yeah. So long course 100 freestyle. I mean, I still swim the 50 and the 200 and both of those are great um, for training. And we'll just sort of see because, you know, some years I feel like my 50 is better. Some years my 200. So I'm not, you know, only focusing on the 50. It would be nice to swim a few events at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, I feel like the 200 freestyle short course is similar to the 100 free long course. So that's also was nice to sort of focus on that um, and sort of think of it as like a good training for the 100 free long course. That makes perfect sense. And I think a lot of people will, yeah, say similar things. 200 free short course or short course meters, short course yards kind of translates well to that 100 long course meter freestyle. Um, so backing it up a little and going off from just ISL, I mean, you, you're 29 years old, which is young. I would say I'm 29 too, but, uh, you know, it, for swimming, you've been around, you've been in competitive swimming at a very high level for a really long time. When, when, when did you first become, you kind of know that you were a swimmer or, or really get into it at a high level? Well, I would say that I started like seriously at age 12. Um, I mean, you know, like if we're going like age group when I really got into swimming and started loving it. Um, but I think, so I was on the US junior national team, I think when I was 17, like that senior year um, of high school. And then I was also um, part of the World University Games at the end of college for Team USA. Um, and then after that, in 2014, I moved to Israel and decided to join their team. Um, so I would say probably in college was when it sort of all began. Okay. And were you born in the United States? Yeah. So I was born in LA, um, but both my parents are Jewish. And I competed in the Maccabi in both 2009 at the end of high school and then also in 2013 at the end of college. And I just had a great experience and wanted to join their swim team. Nice. That's, I, I feel like that's super cool that you can both get that experience of being a United States citizen, going to the NCAA system, you know, living here and also getting back to your roots competing at the Maccabi games, which I feel like uh, you've seen, we, we've seen a lot of 
uh, great athletes through the years compete at and, and also represent Israel internationally. Um, and so you, you got into age group swimming at, at a young age and then was there kind of that aha moment or period for you where you, you were really like, okay, this is something I really want to put all my, all my eggs in this basket. Um, yeah, I mean, I think at 12, I was being coached by Rachel Stratton, who's now um, a coach at ASU. And I just feel like she made practices so fun. And, you know, she, I, I don't remember a specific moment, but I feel like there was a time where she like pulled me aside and was like, you need to come to practice every day. <laughs> You're really good. And I see potential in you. Um, and I also had one or two good friends on the team who were really into swimming. And so I just feel like the environment um, helped me get into it. And then, you know, every year I was improving. So it was kind of like, yeah, let's see, you know, how much faster I can get. I love the swimming community because it's, it's so small. And to, to like, I didn't, I didn't really, I've, I know Rachel. And when I see her on deck, she always, she always makes a note to greet me in a somewhat awkward, but also very friendly way. And it's great. I love it. And you know, it's, I didn't realize she was an age group swimmer, had no idea she coached you. And it's, I love hearing, you know, little tidbits or getting background on people like that. That's so cool. And, and was, I mean, obviously you swim at Stanford, you know, six years later, when did, when did swimming in college for you become a goal? I think in high school, I mean, I think my parents wanted me, you know, to get that scholarship and make college a little easier on them financially. Um, and then I just always enjoyed it. It was probably also my coaches who were like, yeah, you're fast enough. You can get recruited. Um, yeah. So I think Rachel, and then also I had another coach, John Carroll, um, later in high school and both of them, you know, encouraged me to look, you know, reach out and get recruited. And what what was that recruiting process for you like? Because I'm sure I'm sure it's different now, but I'm sure there's still takeaways that you know kids listening could 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 learn from. Um, but like you said, you were reaching out to schools, and for you, what was the recruiting process like? And how did you ultimately end up at Stanford? Yeah, um, I feel like I really reached out. I think I reached out to Stanford multiple times and just <laughs> sending emails. Like that's something that my mom taught me. Um, you know, just keep trying. If you never ask, you'll never get. Um, so I kept reaching out because I wasn't, I don't think that I was one of the top recruits. We actually were the top recruiting class of that year, but I was at the bottom of that list. Um, but I think they just saw that I was tall and lean and had potential. And as a freestyler, you know, you always need an extra relay swimmer. So that worked out well for me. Was, was Stanford at, at the top of your list for you um, academically and athletics wise? And, or did, did that just kind of end up falling into place? Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I think, my top school. I also looked at um, some of the Ivy Leagues. My brother swam for Yale. So he was there already. And, uh, you know, I was familiar with that program. And then I was also looking at Cal, but it just sort of came down to Stanford having the best of both. Hmm. Did, did having an older brother impact you in swimming? Did, yeah. You also had, you know, prefer, swam, at, swam in college, swam at a high level. Yeah. So he actually wasn't recruited. Um, so I think maybe that even gave my parents like a little more of a push to get me <laughs> to be recruited. Um, but yeah, I mean, we did everything when we were younger, um, and we, uh, you know, we're super close. So seeing him enjoy swimming in college definitely had an influence on me. How big is the age gap between you two? Two years. Well, it's a little over but two years in school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys were, you guys were pretty close, went to high school together. Mm -hmm. uh, did you always swim club together as well? Yeah, we swam for Team Santa Monica. It was okay. probably the closest um, uh, team. But and I'll, like some people, I think, from my area went down, you know, to Mission Viejo or did the long drive, you know, to Golden West. But my parents said, nope, you're going to figure out how to swim well here <laughs> for the bigger names. But it doesn't matter. You can do well uh, locally. And I mean, just in club swimming, especially having an older sibling, um, 
did, what, what did you come to find that you enjoyed about swimming? I mean, did you like that you were just good at it or did you like the social aspect or, you know, was there a part of it, the, the physicality and being in the water that you enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, I think at first it was socially, you know, like Rachel, Coach Rachel and, you know, the other two friends of mine, um, that it was just kind of a a fun thing to do. And I always liked sports. I mean, not that I necessarily played other sports, but I always liked, you know, going outside and doing something physical. Um, And then, yeah, I think just sort of improving and having that success as a young swimmer then helped me sort of you know, have that goal oriented sense and always wanting to see how far I could go. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you make it to Stanford, you get there. And was that, um, was that a culture shock for you? Just, I mean, the, the transition from high school to college, I think is a, is a big one for a lot of seniors in high school. What was it like for you? Yeah, it was pretty hard, you know, going to a school with such a reputation and a lot of fast swimmers on the team. Um, I was definitely very intimidated and very quiet when I got there. But luckily, after a few months, I, you know, got used to it, got used to the training and how hard every session was, um, and then started to enjoy it a little bit more. I think also a few months in, we started competing. And so then I, you know, they saw the potential in me because I'm not necessarily a great trainer. Um, but then it was more exciting once I was doing better in the competitions. <laughs> and that seems like it. Uh, yeah. I feel like you have trainers and you have racers and so you're a racer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And were, what was the training like for you at the time? Were you in more of the mid group or the sprint group or a, a hybrid of that? Um, yeah, this is bad but I have to like really think about what it was like at the beginning um but yeah I I think I was mostly sprint there were definitely days when I would go into the diving well and do sprints um but then also sometimes would be thrown into mid D so that I could work for that 200 freestyle was there a particular time in that freshman season you remember that was um was was stands out to you as being challenging or, or testing your will or, uh, you know, really, really pushing you to the limit? Well, I do remember during Christmas training, um, we, at least during my time, would stay on the Stanford campus just because we had amazing facilities so, and good weather normally. <laughs> Um, so why not stay? Uh, but this particular day, it was pouring rain. And I just remember, like, I don't even remember what the set was, but it was a struggle. And I think our coaches, you know, were getting frustrated and getting angry, um, or, you know, just trying to push us because we were struggling. And uh, I just remember it was like the whole entire scene was not <laughs> a great experience. But, you know, we came together as a team and sort of you know, stood up to the challenge. And I think that was, now it's nice to like, look back at and laugh at. (laughs) For sure. Um, Yeah, I'm sure at the, at the time, maybe not the best experience, but uh, like you said, good to look back upon. And then, I mean, when you look back at your time generally in Stanford now, are there things that stand out to you? Yeah. Um, So I think junior year, I was on two winning relays, the 200 and 400 free relays. So I think those moments definitely stand out. And I just remember our little huddle before the 400 free, um, you know, last event of the three-day meet. And well, I guess now it's four, but whatever. At that that, that time, it was three. three. Yeah. Um, And I just remember our senior, Betsy Webb, you know, saying, like, just have fun. I know that there's so much stress on us, but I just want, like, this is my last race. I want us to just have fun. And I remember Maddie Schaefer and I looked at each other and just kind of smiled, like, we're so nervous right now, really. (laughs) How are we supposed to have fun? But it, like, gave us something to laugh about. And I think that relaxed both of us. And then we went on to win and I think break the American record in that one. I, th- I think that's correct. Uh, from, from what I'm reading, uh, mm-hmm. yes, the U S U S record in the foreign free relay, you guys were three ten, which is yeah. pretty speedy. Uh, and then like you said, you won the title in the tuner and free relay as well. Um, well, I mean, was that, was that just a great, was there a great team chemistry that junior year for you or 
were for you personally was did something really click and fall into place for you or both yeah i think so it was maddie me sam woodward and betsy and we kind of knew that that was going to be the relay so i felt like we were training together um really well and like you know knew that we had a shot at winning and sort of had that as the goal the entire year Hmm. and so and would you so that are you saying that kind of motivated you and in, in just in terms of training that whole year? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, also that was my junior year and sophomore year. I hadn't done that great. So I, you know, had the sort of sophomore slump as they used to call it. Um, so I, you know, had that extra motivation as well. Just like I wanted to get back up and swim well at NCs. And then following your junior year, was that when Greg came to campus as the head coach, Greg Meehan? Yes. Yeah. So it was the summer of 2012 um, was after my junior year. And that's when he um, took over after trials. Okay. And I mean, what was that like your senior year to have, to have that, you know, your head coach change? Um, I didn't really mind. I mean, I did have a good relationship with Lee, but I feel like I was pretty good at change. And I, throughout my career, you know, I said like I had Rachel as a coach and then I had John my, the end of high school. So I felt like I was kind of used to it just because in age group, I had had many coaches. Um, and I always like hearing from different coaches because I feel like every single one has a different perspective and not necessarily that they have something different in technique or, you know, style of racing, but that they might just say it in a way that clicks a little better. So I was sort of excited Um, and you know, there was nothing I could do. That's what had happened. So I just sort of went with it and it was a really good experience. Yeah. I mean, what, how would you compare that to your other three years, just in terms of what did you take away from that year, especially being, you know, a senior and and I'm assuming a leader on the team. Yeah. So I think just, because there were, you know, 24, about 24 girls, um, that I feel like we kind of created a team. Um, and I think that he did a really good job of trying to make that transition easier. So he sort of allowed the seniors to, you know, control a little, not control a little more, but, you know, have a bigger influence on the team. And so he sort of, um, obviously still coached us, but allowed the team chemistry to come from us a bit more and step back and observe and then, you know, make his changes and do a little bit more the following years. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, did, did, did you appreciate that opportunity? Did you feel like you had more uh, authority to kind of be your true self as a leader in that position? Yeah, I think so. I think it was nice, I guess, looking back now to sort of take that position. Um, But it felt very natural. Like it didn't feel like we were forced to be more of leadership um, or, you know, that he wasn't doing enough or anything. Like it felt like a very good transition. Hmm. And so then uh, you you finish at Stanford. um, And then what in were you pretty sure at that point that you wanted to represent Israel internationally? Um, Yeah. So I finished my um, eligibility in 2013, but I still had two more quarters left to finish Mm. school. And so I, um, I wasn't sure yet, but I figured that I might as well finish out uh, my classes and then sort of figure it out. And so I did those two quarters and then studied for the MCAT, which was kind of like an extra quarter. Um, that's the test for medical school and then swam at nationals that summer. Um, and then after the summer of 2014 sort of went home and had a lot of long discussions at the dinner table with my parents about what I should do next. Um, and it just sort of felt like any, you know, any experience I have next would be great. You know, I could continue swimming and this just sort of seemed like a great opportunity. The, there was a little bit of hesitation when you said long discussions at the dinner table with your family. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that and, and what options you were weighing? I'm, I'm guessing medical school was one of those options as well as continuing to swim. Yeah, definitely medical school was in there, but it sort of, 
um, felt like I could take a little bit more time to swim and, you know, you can get a medical degree a little bit later, but swimming, it would be hard. You know, you couldn't start it back up after medical school. So I, I was pretty sure that I wanted to keep swimming. Um, just sort of that same mindset of like, I keep improving. So I want to see how far I can get. Um, and then, yeah, I was kind of looking at a, some pro teams in the U.S., but there weren't really any at the time. So Israel seemed like a really good option and they were super welcoming and happy to, to accept me there um, and join the National Training Center. So that seemed like a great option and I always knew you know like if it didn't work out that's okay but might as well take you know the risk and move there yeah and I mean did it work out yes <laughs> I, yeah I'm so happy that I moved um I just feel like I've grown so much also as a person and learned about a new culture learned a new language learned so much more and had amazing experiences yeah so you did you move there um after the summer of 2014 yeah in the fall in November was when I moved um but yeah I I went there for a a short trip just to visit um a a month or so before then but yeah I kind of just moved and like looking back I didn't know what I was getting into like I hadn't even talked to the head coach I'd only talked to other people um so I really had no idea what was coming but it worked out really well yeah. So, so what, what, what did you find once, once you moved there in November, um, especially it being, you know, uh, a, a little under two years out from, from the Olympic games, which I'm assuming was a goal of yours. Yes. Yeah. So that was definitely one of the big goals. Um, it was an adjustment. I lived in the training center, which was convenient just because I didn't know my way around. I didn't know the language. Um, so it worked well that I, you know, it was, it's kind of like the OTC, um, just that everything's inside. Um, you have, you know, gym, dining hall, pool. Um, so yeah, that definitely made it easier. My, the head coach at the time didn't speak English, which was a struggle, but everyone else there knew English. And so I was always um, able to, get help from other people but and now looking back it was great because it forced me to learn Hebrew even faster so yeah it was it was definitely a struggle the first year but it was great Um, I feel like on weekends uh, when we would have time off I would go to different families homes and sort of see what it's like to live in Israel and be part of an Israeli family so that was nice to sort of travel the country and see that was there specific things that you picked up from those family those weekend family uh environments that you know came to you as like the biggest surprises or like wow I never would have realized this otherwise yeah um I think well the families that I saw weren't necessarily super religious like I didn't know exactly what it would be like moving to Israel um but I feel like because they're Israeli they sort of like know their roots and then aren't necessarily as religious as I would have expected. Obviously there are, it's definitely a spectrum, um, but especially I think in the the swimming community, they aren't as religious, but they still go home every weekend and have big family dinners. So that's one of the things that I feel like I learned was just like appreciation for family um, and made me miss my family a little bit more, but it was still very nice to be welcomed into other people's families. Yeah, I would, I would think moving, you know, halfway around the world uh, after being in LA for your childhood with your family, obviously, and then being at Stanford, which is, you know, six hour drive, short plane ride home. Um, was, was that a hard adjustment? Obviously, you had to learn the language, but just, um, you know, the culture shock and being away from all your familiar people. Yeah, I remember the first few nights that I was there, I was jet lagged. And so I was, you know, up in the middle of the night and able to call my, my family, um, just because of the time change, it worked well, so that I was kind of comforted those first few nights. Um, but then I, I, I was actually fine. I mean, I remember when I was little, I used to go over to sleepovers, uh, you know, and be away from my family at a younger age than I think most people. So I don't think I really had too much uh, trouble with that. 
And yeah, I think that I'm just sort of the type of person that like once I get to a place that I haven't been for a while, then I realize how much I missed it, but don't necessarily, you know, get sort of absorbed in what's going on where I am. So, yeah. yeah. And so then, so you, you are able to make this transition uh, and how long, how long did you end up staying there and training? Um, well, I think technically I'm still sort of there. If you ask me where my home is right now, it's okay. very up in the air. But I, yeah, I mean, when it's not COVID times, normally I'm back and forth between Israel and San Diego, at least the past couple of years. Um, but I was there full time, I would say for the first three years. Okay. Uh, which included your Olympic birth in 2016. Um, I mean, can you tell me just a little bit about that experience? What, what goes into making an Olympic team for Israel as well as competing at the actual Olympics? Yeah, so qualifying with a FINA A cut in an event, as long as there, isn't, there aren't two people faster than you, um, qualifies you. And so, yeah, actually when I first moved there, it was funny because I had been home for a few months just trying to decide what I was doing and wasn't necessarily in great shape when I actually got to Israel. Um, but we had our qualification meet. It was the first possible um, meet that you could qualify for it was in April of 2015. So it was only five months after I moved there. And I think even though like that was the goal to qualify, I think probably my coach was a little skeptical that I would be able to you know, get back into shape quick enough. Um, but we sort of, you know, said that that was the goal, tapered for it. And I ended up qualifying in the 50 freestyle. And I think sort of what happened was that I was relaxed for it, preparing for the 100 two days later and just, you know, swam a really good race. Um, so, yeah, that was super cool. Um, then I was qualified a year and a half out, mm -hmm. which definitely has advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I would say an advantage is, you know, knowing that you're in and then you can just train for the Olympics, but also a disadvantage is, okay, I made my first Olympics. Now I can chill a little bit more. <laughs> um, and then also that summer, um, even though I had qualified for the world championships time-wise, I wasn't able to compete because I was switching national, like sport nationalities. So that was also sort of difficult once I had qualified for the Olympics, but didn't have a big competition coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, obviously it was nice. My mom had come out to the meet for April. And so she saw me qualify. It was a very, very nice surprise. I, I can imagine. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Making your first Olympics with your mom there is that's, that's great. Uh, were you, so did you end up swimming just the 50 at the Olympics or did you end up qualifying for other events as well? Yeah. So that summer, um, instead of going to world championships, there was Israeli nationals and I qualified for the hundred free there. And then also, um, the, the rules are that if you qualify in an, with an A cut in an event, then you can swim your B cuts. Hmm. So I, that, so I was, I had the B cut in the 200 free as well. And then the other very exciting thing was in 2016, we qualified our four by 100 free relay. So we also had that. And it was the first time that Israeli women had a swimming relay in the Olympics. So, so you not only uh, made your first Olympics, but you also made history at your first Olympics, which, which is super cool. Um, and then you go to the actual games after having not had a major international meet in two years. And uh, can you tell me a little bit about that experience, especially with that? I mean, that's a lot of events to swim over, over the eight day meet. Yeah. So we have European championships. They oh, act right. in the Olympic yeah. year, there is Europeans in May. So that was really nice to have that as, you know, like a, a you know, practice. Um, and I think, so the week before the Olympics started, we were already in the village um, and I got sick. I actually had sinusitis. So I was in bed for a few days and didn't feel my best. 
Um, I didn't even compete in the 200 because I didn't think that I had, you know, the energy for that. But I was like, it was still fun to swim in the 50 and the 100. And one of the cool things about the relay was that when we qualified, I went 53.4. So went really fast, way faster than my best time. Um, But then, and when we went basically the same time in the Olympics, which means that the other, and I swam, I don't know, like 54 high, 55 something. Um, So the other girls sort of picked up the slack and swam fast. So that was a nice little part of the Olympics since my other events weren't that great. Sorry about that. Uh, what is, what does sinusitis entail? Um, so it, it was like a cold, but it just got a little bit worse. Um, like sinus infection. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I, I feel like as a swimmer, I used to get sinus infections all the time. I feel like probably a lot of swimmers get sinus infections. Yeah. I mean, looking back, I should have been in the pool a bit more and not like when I get sick, I like to just sit in bed and wait for it to go away. Um, but you know, when you have no option and the Olympics are about (laughs) to come up, it would have been better to just sort of push through it. So now I know, and for anyone out there, (laughs) I think it's a better way to go. Good good advice. Uh, especially a week out from the Olympics. (laughs) Um, yeah, there's nothing you can do and you're going to eventually get over it. You know, of course I started feeling better, you know, the day before it started, but then I had sat in bed for too long. So it was <laughs> ideal. That, that totally makes sense. And so then after the Olympics, um, when did you start training with team elite it, 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 in some capacity? Um, in 2017, I think it was January of 2017, David came over to Israel. Um, it had already been announced that he would be, I think it's called technical director of Israeli swimming, but basically just help improve our program. And with that, um, David would come over, was in, is in, is in constant conversation with Israeli Swimming Association. And then some of us can go to San Diego to train. So we started in 2017 when he was still in Charlotte. That first year we were going to Charlotte. I'm very happy that he moved to San Diego and now uh, this is where we come. seems like a much nicer training location. (laughs) Yeah, and also super nice that my parents are only two hours away so I can visit them as well. Didn't even think about that, but that makes total sense as well. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And so um, were, were you a part of ISL in the first season as well? No, I was signed up to be and I was supposed to, but I got injured two weeks before. So I wasn't able to participate. Okay. And I mean, just you, you go, you know, you, you hit a lot of milestones after 2016, just in terms of your career, you would swim in collegiately. NCAA champion, NCAA All American. Um, you'd been, you, you were an Olympian now. Um, was there, did you, did you just feel like you could, there was still more improvement to be made? What was motivating you after those Olympic Games? Yeah, I think time wise and also even like place wise, you know, I'd been to the competitions, but I wanted to do even better at them, you know, semifinal, final. Um, So just knowing that, or that I could, you know, swim faster and see how, you know, much better I could get in the next few years. Um, I, yeah. So after 2016, after the games, I um, applied to medical school and that process and to um, schools in Israel. Mm -hmm. And that takes a year. So then I didn't, I had one year of training with David in Charlotte and then started medical school in the fall of 2017 and then was in school for the next two years until a month or a month and a half before world championships in Guangzhou. That sounds crazy. Was with, I mean, how do you, how do you manage medical school and swimming at, at, at a professional level? Yeah, it was hard. Um, I think, at the beginning, swimming was sort of put, you know, in the background and I was really focusing on getting into school. And then once I kind of got the hang of it, 
I would, um, you know, focus on swimming more. And luckily the school year would end by June or July. And then, you know, the big competition, whether that first summer it was European championships in August and then, um, world championships were in July. So I always had like a month, um, to really hone in on swimming before, you know, the, the big competition, but I definitely didn't do as well as I wanted to in Europeans and worlds, but you know, I, it was a good, like, it was a bit much, but also it was nice to sort of have something else to always focus on. So, you know, when I was having a bad day in school, then I had swimming to sort of, you know, relieve that stress and vice versa. Yeah. And I mean, especially with how Olympic centric swimming is for better or for worse, it seems like that was the perfect two years to do it kind of, you know, bridge the gap of that Olympic quad. And then heading into 2020, you, I guess you, you did, you weren't, you didn't have school med school that year of the 2019 to 2020 was, do you felt heading into the Olympics, not knowing they were going to be postponed? Do you feel like that was beneficial? Yeah. So I think having that, um, year leading up to the Olympics was good, but I think like, ideally I would have two years. So this actually worked out really well, (laughs) a lot more time to prepare. Yeah. Um, like I said, I was injured. I had a concussion, um, in the fall of 2019 and that took me a while to get over. Um, so I think the combination of already not being trained for the past two years and then having an injury for a month and a half, what was going to be hard leading into Tokyo. I was getting back into it. Um, and that Des Moines meet was really good in March, but now having this extra time is very good for, for my swimming at least. Yeah. I mean, do do you, obviously, like you said, the extra time has been good, but have there been ups and downs for you throughout this last COVID year? Um, as I'm guessing, you know, as, as there have been for many. Yeah, I think I did a pretty good job of just saying, yes, the Olympics will happen the year later. Um, Cause I think mentally it was hard. I think also going back to Israel for the summer and getting involved in medical school and sort of having that to take my mind off of it, I think is a lot easier than, you know, sitting around and wondering, you know, I didn't have time to think about whether the Olympics were having, it was just, I was going to train and it was a nice thing to do at the end of the day um, after I was sitting around in school. Um, So I think that it worked out really well. Um, I also, when I was training at home, I had a teammate, uh, Marcus Schlesinger, who was with me so we could push each other. And he, as a male sprinter, loves going to the gym and working out. And then I wanted to, you know, get more swimming in. So I think both of us sort of helped each other during quarantine um, to push each other. If I was at home alone, it wouldn't have been good. But luckily I had a training partner and then I went back to Israel and then came back and, you know, got ready for ISL. And so I feel like I had things that always helped me through the time. Yeah. And, and just to wrap things up and to look forward a little, I mean, what do you feel like is pushing you now and what are you looking forward to? Obviously the Olympics hopefully are on the horizon, but just in the next couple of weeks, couple months. Um, I, well, so I'm going to the San Antonio meet, um, in March, and then we're doing a training camp in Tenerife in one of the Canary islands. And then, um, I think I'll be competing after that as well in Sweden. So just sort of getting back into racing as much as possible and focusing on there being an Olympics. And then I think past that ISL was so fun that I hope I can do it again. I do need to go back to medical school, but if I can manage to make it work and at least do one more season, that would be awesome. Do you, how much more medical school do you have at this point? I have two more years um, and they're in the hospital. So I won't have that much time, you know, when it's in the classroom, or, you know, studying at home, it's a little easier to go to swim practice. So I'm definitely going to have to figure out how to do both, but I really do want to keep swimming. That's, that's super cool to hear. And especially, you know, 
we see a lot of athletes try to make it to that through that Olympic quad and then say, okay, I'm good. And uh, I feel like the ISL especially has done a great job at, at giving athletes more options besides just focusing on that Olympics. So that's great to hear that. Yeah. Even after that Olympics, you're hoping to continue your career. Yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed. Uh, well, Andy, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me today. It's, it's been great hearing about uh, your, your long and storied career and um, any, any parting thoughts for our audience before we sign off today? Thank you for having me. I mean, it was fun rehashing the memories of Stanford. <laughs> Haven't thought about it for a while. Well, definitely. Yeah. Th thank you again for your time and for coming on and sharing your stories with us. Thanks. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.